Welcome back to the Baseball 360 Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Kandel. Today, we have a gigantic episode for you guys. With the baseball season approaching less than five days away, we are going to give you our 2023 season predictions. And of course, you can't forget our buddy Foz is going to join us as well. That's right. This is a big show for us. We got a lot to cover. We're going to be predicting pretty much everything from the division winners all the way to who's going to have the most home runs. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. And I'll be remiss if I didn't say, you know, our buddy Sean is not with us on this show, unfortunately, but we kind of did a little shake up on our end. And uh, Mike, if you want to kind of touch up on what our strategy is going forward, you know, we, we think this will be best for everyone, including you. I mean, for you, I think it's going to be a lot easier for you to kind of gather us all and like make sure we pump out as much content as possible on the channel. Absolutely no. So Sean is going to devote as much time as he can to the 40 Minutes to Flushing podcast. Uh, He's shown a lot of dedication with that. He's uh, working on some cool graphics for us, and um, he wants to make sure he's got his energy ready for that Mets podcast. He's still going to make the occasional appearance on here, as well as many other guests. Some will be our friends. Others, some of them are in the MLB. Indeed, yeah. We're not going to say just yet. Don't want to jinx you know, some of these guys that are going to come on potentially, but uh, we do have someone locked in. He's a pretty big name in the space. Uh, I'm sure a lot of New York Metro fans are going to definitely want to tune into that because it's going to be a show that they're not going to want to miss. And hopefully we get some cool nuggets out from this particular person because he's been in the biz for so many years and super excited to get this opportunity with him. So we're definitely looking forward to that. I'd say uh, mid-May, it will probably have that episode out. So definitely stay tuned for that. Absolutely. We have a lot of stuff coming on this channel. And we just want to say thank you to those, to those who have subscribed so far, who have uh, followed us on TikTok. The TikTok is popping on Instagram. We are now on Twitter. We have a Discord. We have a Reddit page. We are, we are blowing up. We're everywhere. Um, give us a like, give us a follow. Uh, we have a ton of content coming. You're going to really enjoy it. That Roki Sasaki TikTok really blew up. Uh, we'll discuss that a little bit more in detail. Let's go to first. Yeah, let's do that, Foz. Let's get out of the batter's box. Let's bust it down the first baseline. The WBC finally wrapped up in epic fashion. You saw two of the world's greatest players going mano e mano on the biggest stage. I got to be honest, that was that was fun to watch. Um, I think it showed a little symbolism in sort of a passing of the torch way, so to speak. I know you enjoyed it, Foz. You know, with the WBC, especially the way it started off, I liked the way it ended. It was fun. I, I enjoyed it. I really did. Yeah, I definitely want to dive a little deeper into that at bat with Trout and Otani, basically the end of WBC. Uh, I just want to go back just a little bit because I want to do touch up on that Roki Sasaki start. Now, he didn't quite show up and strike out 10 batters like you predicted or go with the five innings. However, he did show a lot of promise. And, you know, ultimately, Japan walked off that game against Mexico, who put up a big fight. I was very surprised that, you know, they were pretty much there. They almost had it ready to go into the finals and face the U.S., uh, on your side, what were you kind of thinking? What did you see from Sasaki? And, you know, when do you expect him to be in the majors? First inning, first at bat, I believe it was. It was the um, Randy Arozarena at bat. I was impressed right off the bat. The fastball, we all knew, but that sweeping, if I'm not mistaken, slider, that thing can bite. But I got to give Mexico credit. The second time around, they started laying off that pitch and he had to start throwing strikes. And shout out to Luis Urias hitting that bomb, and uh, somebody commented on TikTok that he hit a bomb, which I love it. I love that type of interaction. You know, the start against Mexico was the worst start he had in the WBC, but if you look at his overall numbers throughout the tournament, the guy's electric. He's only 21 years old, so he's he's got some growing to do, which is who knows how hard he'll throw by then. It's going to be some time before he comes to the majors. That has nothing to do with his skill level. That's just kind of the way they operate out there. He really impressed me uh, a great deal. And also, Munataka Murakami with the walk-off double. You might see him a little bit sooner than Sasaki. It was an exciting game against Mexico for sure. Uh, Otani, you know, uh, there again, leading off the bottom of the ninth, hit a leadoff double. 
kind of got that whole dugout going. Like, we can do this. We can win this now. Let's do it. A couple of batters later, Murakami walks up there. It's a walk-off double. They go right, right to the finals. So this Japan team, you know, we kind of said in the beginning of our shows, really, they were kind of the powerhouses out in the East. And we kind of speculated that they had a really good chance of winning this thing. They wanted to win this tournament. Now, of course, every country wanted to win the tournament, but it, they, it means a lot to them. It, it really means a lot. In the seventh inning, they were sending out, and you saw it on TV, you saw Darvish and Otani both walking to the bullpen, and I couldn't help but think, I think USA is screwed here. Yeah, I mean, they were pretty much locked down the whole game. And of course, you know, going to that ninth inning, it was the dream matchup. Everyone saw Trout was due up third in that lineup. Otani was coming out of the bullpen to close it out for Team Japan, up 3-2. to two. Uh, Mookie Betts, second up, hit a ground ball into short for a double play. And, you know, that kind of sucked the air out of the Team USA because they did have a leadoff walk there. Uh, but, you know, we saw the best matchup you could possibly imagine, probably in the last 30 years in Major League Baseball, maybe even farther than that. You had two guys on the same team facing each other. And I want to bring up something that Rich Eisen said on his show because it's very interesting and it would be interesting to see if MLB does this. I doubt they do, but I think they should implement this at some point because they are going to do some tweaks in the regular season. But every pitch in that at-bat, Otani and, and Trout, that would have went past the pitch clock timer and the, everyone would have had a violation, both Trout and Otani. And so in a game like that, do you really want to see a clock speed up this process? Like, oh, must get this ball out in 20 seconds or else. Or do you want to see these guys really just zone in to what their profession is? Otani, trying to get the best hitter in baseball out. That's to be argued now. Trout side, well, I want to hit a home run off this guy. I don't care if I get a sing. I want to hit a home run. Like, I want to make an impact in this game. Ultimately, Otani got him, and I don't think not one person was complaining about how long that at bat took. Maybe Christopher Russo, but outside <laughs> of him, uh, you know, I think everyone else was just. I, I was just. I was glued the whole the whole at bat. I was glued at it, and it was just an incredible at bat. That adds a level of nuance to that whole pitch clock debate. Nobody cares how long that matchup took. Now, obviously, not. Not every game you're going to see that. You're not always going to see two Titans go up against each other, but I wasn't paying attention to no clock during that at-bat. Like I touched on earlier, this was very symbolic. Uh, passing of the torch, not only for the Angels franchise, but maybe even Major League Baseball. That was, and personally, I'm sure the two guys like each other. It, it This has nothing to do with their personal relationship but it was kind of like a this is my game now moment. I mean, he he struck Mike Trout out through his hat almost like, sorry, man, this is my game now. And let me be clear here. We like Mike Trout on this network. <laughs> I, I just want to be 100% clear with that. But we got to call it like we see it. Otani's, Otani's in. Otani's in right now. I can't wait to get the Mets jersey with him on it. Ugh. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's calm it down there, Mets fans. Uh, look, Mike Trout doesn't throw a ball on the mound. I mean, he, he could. I mean, he could definitely do that, but he doesn't throw it like Otani does. And so with that in itself, in my opinion, he's the best baseball player in the world, bar none. Can't argue with me on that. You kind of have to be. If you, if you can do both at the level he does, yeah, boom, he is. He is the best, right? Like the argument's over, right? That was probably awkward when they both got back to camp, you know, both getting settled in, you know, putting stuff in their lockers. It's like, hey, what's up? Oh, hi, man. Showing off their gold and silver. Well, I'm sure not showing off silver, but showing off the gold award uh, medal, of course. Those guys will make a third place season very fun for you. Ah, uh, <laughs> well, I guess you, uh, we got a little bit of our predictions leaked out there, but uh, I, I just to kind of wrap everything up for Team USA, you know, they did everything they could to try to win this game, but I mean, ultimately, Japan 
it was just a force to be reckoned with. I believe this is the WBC that will give the tournament some life. You're going to start seeing it around the world. Everybody's going to be talking about it. They're going to be like, ooh, I can't wait to the next World Baseball Classic. Not everybody feels that way, but I think the love for the tournament is growing. But we could finally put the WBC to bed. Let's turn our attention to the regular season. Let's go to second base. With the spring training coming to an end, the regular season is less than five days away. Oh, it feels so good to have baseball back. Starting with our 2023 predictions, we're going to turn our attention to the AL East. Fazio and I are obviously sharing a brain on this one. Weird coming from a Yankees fan. We both think the Toronto Blue Jays are going to take that AL East. They're going to take that step forward, beat the big bad Yankees. Fazio, why do you feel this way? Yeah, I'm sorry, Yankee fans. I know you're probably going to call me a fake fan, and I guess that's fine. But to me, I think the Yankees are going to come out struggling a bit. Uh, they lost Carlos Rodon. He's not going to come back until about early May, maybe late April, uh, the earliest. That's being optimistic. Uh, they lost Luis Severino recently to a latch strain. He's going to start the season on the IL. And so Nestor Cortez, you know, he's a great starter. He, he'll provide you, you know, 12 to 15 wins, hopefully. That's like, you know, his his uh, his potential. And so, and obviously you got Garrett Cole, the ace, uh, which is, you know, he'll, he'll have a similar year as, as years past. But, you know, looking past that, they have Johnny Brito, who might be their fifth starter. And Domingo Herman is also going to be starting. Who's like kind of they, they're not really to me like those solid quality starters uh, like the Blue Jays have in their rotation. And so we'll get into that a little bit. But um, in my opinion, because the Yankees will limp out a little bit to start, I don't think you can win a division starting in April, but you can certainly lose it. And I just foresee the Blue Jays coming out hot. And they don't have as many games against their division rivals, so they'll have more opportunities to flex their muscle, play in Toronto, and really just show out uh, with Vlad Guerrero. We'll have a little prediction later about him, but I think he's going to take a step up in seasons past and probably see the best season that he's ever played. And they also added a couple of guys, including Dalton Varsho, which Yankee fans, I'm sorry to say this, he's going to give us a lot of trouble this year. Expect to see a couple of home runs from him in the Yankee Stadium early on and uh, start to give us a headache. Uh, so in my opinion, I think because of the Yankees struggling early on and the Blue Jays taking advantage of that, I think they're going to pace themselves enough, at least early on, that by the time the end of the season rolls around, we're going to look back at the season and be like, damn, the Yankees really should have taken like three or four games in April, and we could have been there to win the division. But I see the Blue Jays taking that because of that reason. What do you think about that, Mike? I kind of agree with you. The division is going to be decided in April or May, even though it may seem like it's decided later in the season. It's up to the Blue Jays. They have to get out to a hot start. You know, this way they could f maybe coast through the rest of the season. Their offense, I think with the addition of Varsho, is only going to get better. I love their starting rotation. I think Alec Manoa is an ace of beyond ace i i'm so impressed by that guy and just the rest of the rotation you got gausman uh the addition of chris bassett to lengthen that rotation if they could just get jose barrios to bounce back even in the slightest it's just another pitcher they have they have one of the better closers in the game in jordan romano uh, i'm just worried that the only thing that could really get to them is like i said if they start off slow and they see the yankees going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, that could uh, ruin their psyche because I feel like the Yankees kind of live rent-free in their head, unfortunately. But hopefully they can get over that this year by taking a big hump and taking advantage of the Yankees' early season rotation injuries, as well as the ability to get over that horrible playoff loss last year. That's... Oof. I mean, especially losing a game like that at home, if they could just kind of wipe the slate clean, start fresh, there's no reason why the Toronto Blue Jays can't take this division. I don't see the Yankees getting a whole lot of trouble from the Red Sox. The Orioles, they're a great story. They're on their way up. They might step back a little bit 
because of just a lack of rotation depth. The Rays are always involved. I'm not going to count them out, but I don't think they have an incredible offense. They could definitely be beat for sure. This is a Blue Jays-Yankees division for sure, and I think the Blue Jays, it's their year. Moving on to the American League Central. Fazio and I do not see eye-to-eye on this division. He thinks a team is going to bounce back from a season that was littered in disappointment, injuries, controversy with the manager, the owner. I think... I think this division is going to stay the same. So I'm going to pick the Cleveland Guardians to take the AL Central for the second year in a row. I like their lineup, especially the addition of Josh Bell. Not only do I think that was the perfect hitter for them to sign, I think that was the perfect team for Josh Bell. Middle of the market, no pressure, put him in the cleanup spot, you know, 25 homers. 80-plus RBI, somebody to hit behind Jose Ramirez. I love Stephen Kwan in the leadoff spot, his plate discipline, you know, putting the ball in play. You know, he's not an automatic out. He's an out you have to earn if you're a pitcher. Andres Jimenez, you know, another solid hitter. And the pitching rotation, they're getting banged up a little this spring, but they were a model of consistency last year. They make their starts when they're supposed to. Shane Bieber... You know, he's an electric pitcher. The other part of their rotation, middle of the rotation, you know, you have to see if these guys can do it again, like Tristan McKenzie, Cal Quantrill, Plesak, and whatnot. Most of the reason why I think the Guardians are also going to win the division is nobody else really impresses me a great deal in that division. The White Sox are solid. I'll give them that, Foz. You'll get your turn. Don't worry. But the Minnesota Twins, nah, I, I'm sorry. You have no pitching. I like Pablo Lopez, but outside of that, you know, they don't really offer much. And um, the Detroit Tigers, the Kansas City Royals, I mean, I like the Royals' future a little bit better than the Tigers currently, but they're going to be cellar dwellers this season for sure. However, however... This division is still the weakest in baseball, in my opinion. As much praise as I've given the Guardians, this is still the weaker divisions in baseball, for sure. Why do you feel so highly on the team you are predicting to win this division? Going to this year with the White Sox, they just got to be healthy. And let's preface this by saying all these predictions are based off of everyone's health, obviously. So with that being said, Tim Anderson, Eloy Jimenez, Luis Robert, even Andrew Vaughn, some games he missed last year. A lot of those guys missed a lot of games within the last year. They weren't around. And honestly, I think that was the reason why they lost the division. Now, going into this year, Jose Abreu no longer with the club. He's with the Houston Astros, who we'll get to next in the AL West. However, to me, I don't think he really was their X factor. I think their X factor is going to be those guys I just mentioned stepping up and producing their offense. Because I look at their starting rotation – I think it's better than the Cleveland Guardians. Lucas Giolito didn't have a great year last year. He's a prime candidate to bounce back. They got Lance Lynn. He was a little banged up last year. He's, you know, a little older, a little more veteran presence. I think he still has some gas left in the tank to really come out and have a good year. And then you got their ace, Dylan Cease. He's looking to come up, be a prime guy. He's young and looking to get up the hill to be the ace that they were looking to get the last few years. So, I look at this lineup and I'm like, I don't know, man. If they're if they're healthy, they play a full season, I think they could take this division. And I think they can get to like 93 wins. Now, I will say that I believe that this division will come down to a matter of three games. I think the Guardians will win around 91. And I think the White Sox will win around 94. Um, so it's going to be a close race. It's going to come up to the end. I don't think you could pinpoint in a season like we can with the Blue Jays and Yankees saying – oh, this is where they lost the division. I think it's just going to be back and forth, back and forth all year. Um, And as long as everyone's healthy, I just see this team succeeding. And they got Andrew Benatendi too. Let's not forget that contract, the largest contract in White Sox franchise history, uh, which is insane. Uh, And I know we were kind of making fun of him our first show, but I look at their lineup and I'm like, yep, I'm picking them. I'm going for it. 
you got to have one team in predictions that you don't think is going to do well that does well. And I think this is where I'm taking them. No, I could respect you going out on a limb. I mean, it's boring to just make chalky predictions, which is why I tweaked a couple of mine at the very last minute. This division is probably the most obvious division when it comes to predictions. Houston Astros, am I right? Am I right? The Houston Astros are going to win this division. So let's just make that clear right now. Fazio also picked the Astros. so Yeah, nothing too like uh, surprising here. I know they're missing um, Jose Altuve for a, a couple of months, max, uh, due to the wrist injury in the WBC. I still think that's just going to be a little bump of the road, like I said last show. And uh, I see this team winning over 100 games easily, uh, even still with uh, Altuve missing. Their rotation is the best in the league, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Fran Valdez is definitely going to be a candidate for Cy Young when it comes down to it. And, uh, I mean, even their other guys could potentially even be thrown in the conversation as well. They have multiple Cy Young Award candidates on this team. Uh, it's kind of unfair, but um, that's just the way that they're built. Dusty Baker coming back again, looking to repeat. Um, and, yeah, I think the Astros will have the most wins in the AL. Yeah, no, I believe so, too. I, I can't see another team in the AL or in baseball, dare I say it, that's as good as the Houston Astros. But I don't want to spend the entire AL West discussion on the Houston Astros. Let's talk about the Mariners. Are they able to repeat their postseason run they made last year, go to the postseason back-to-back years? I say yes. Uh, I believe they will take the last wild card spot in the AL. Um, now, look. This, for them, is good news in terms of the Altuve stuff. And we said this last show. If they can figure out how to beat this team early on without him in the lineup, and they can get a couple of series wins against them, then they got a really good chance at making the playoffs. Now, look, they're not going to win 100 games, but they may get close to 90. And I think they can get to 90 wins if they take advantage of the Astros early on. They could beat up on the A's a bit and even you know, the angels in a, in a sense, I think the Mariners with Jared Kalenic, I think he's going to take a huge leap this year. I said that, I think a couple of episodes ago, Julio Rodriguez is probably going to be in a uh, conversation to be the MVP in the league. As long as he stays healthy, obviously all this depends on health and uh, they got a solid starting rotation too. Um, every one of those guys has got something to contribute. Marco Gonzalez, maybe like a little in the middle of the pack there, but they do have, Logan Gilbert, and they have George Kirby as well, who came over from the Twins. And so these guys, I think, are going to really step up. They're going to have a great year. Uh, I I foresee them having at least 10 to 12 wins each. I want to touch on real quick the Teoscar Hernandez trade they made with the Blue Jays. They got themselves a right-handed bat in that lineup, you know, to replace the loss of Mitch Hanniger, which I think is personally an upgrade. Julio Rodriguez is obviously the straw that stirs the drink over there. So, you know, if he's healthy, he's going to be a, a a spark plug, you know, potential MVP candidate. As he goes, the Mariners go. Love the rotation there. I, I love finally seeing Luis Castillo getting to pitch for a better team. He's uh, showing that he has ace-like potential. He's, he's going to have a hell of a season, in my opinion. Mariners fans, get used to going to the postseason. Again, you're going to like this. It's going to be fun for you guys. I had them as my second wild card team. Yeah, and I guess we could just touch up real quick on our wild card teams as well while we're here. So I have the Yankees uh, finishing at the top spot. No surprise. I think they'll flirt with about 96, 97 wins this season. Guardians will be right behind them. Like I said before, they'll probably get around 91. And the Mariners will hover around 90 wins. Maybe they'll get... 89 uh we'll say put it at 89 and i have the rays uh just missing out on this i think they'll get 86 wins this season uh but you actually have them as your third spot in the wild card i'm curious uh why you think you have them there tampa bay is that team they're becoming an organization that you could kind of trust dare i say no matter who's in their lineup no matter who's on the roster they're always competitive I think Kevin Cash is one of the more underrated managers in baseball at this point. They also have some young pitchers. Tyler Glass now, if he's healthy, 
no reason why he can't win the Cy Young this year in the American League. The White Sox are my team on the outside looking in. Now, that doesn't mean they can't flip with the Rays and hit a third wild card spot. I, the only reason why I'm just going with the Rays is they just seem like a model of consistency lately because I've picked against the Rays a couple of years and I was wrong every time. Not again. <laughs> That's fair. I think they're definitely more a consistent model. Uh, they always seem to figure out wanting to throw a guy out there to start a game uh, from the bullpen, throwing out a, what do they call those guys again? Opener. An opener, right. I always forget that name for some reason. I can't think of it. Because it's kind of but... stupid. That's why. <laughs> well, I believe the Yankees are going to do that some some games because of uh, these injuries. But in any case, the Rays are like more strategic in that way. They're They're strategic and trying to get those guys out there just to eat up some innings, save their starters. With Glass now coming off of Tommy John, maybe they'll have to do that a little bit more just to give him a little more rest if need be. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of see the Rays being on the outside looking in. Uh, but I could definitely see why the White Sox are the, your team that is looking out because they're just not as consistent. All right, Fazio, there's some good predictions. Look, anything can happen over a course of a 162-game schedule. What do you think is going to happen with that National League? So I guess we'll start in the East, and I think both of us have the same prediction, and yeah, I'd definitely like to get your thoughts about why you think the Atlanta Braves are going to finish in first in the division. I was trying to avoid being a homer here. Let's be honest. The Mets are a little short offensively compared to the Braves, and I don't think you'll see what happened last year. The Braves started off under 500 and then they went on a ginormous run. I think you're going to see the Braves play consistently throughout the season. It's going to be a dogfight between the three teams. This is the best division in baseball. And I think the Braves have a little bit more confidence. Not that the Mets are intimidated by the Braves or can't beat the Braves. It's just, I think the Braves are solid lineup one through nine. I love the Mets rotation, but the Braves have a great rotation themselves. Young rotation. I think you might see the Edwin Diaz thing come back to bite the Mets in a couple of games, but a couple of games is what's going to decide this division. That's why. And the Philadelphia Phillies, they're going to finish in third place, but they might finish in third place with a 90-win record. That team is stacked. The addition of Trey Turner, are you kidding me? Their offense alone, they should get them back into the third wild card spot for sure. Yeah, so uh, I want to reveal my wild cards uh, after I get through each division, but I will say that I do think the Edwin Diaz injury, yeah, I think it'll cost them at least a couple of games. And it could decide a division for sure. Uh, looking at the rotation for the Braves, it's kind of unfair. Uh, I think they probably have one of the best rotations in the National League for sure. I think it's rival to what the Astros have, uh, in my opinion. And let's not forget about Ronald Acuna Jr. This dude is electric. And he was not good last year at all. Uh, he was a little banged up. And in my opinion, this year, he could be one of the bigger bounce-back candidates um, to come out of the NL. And I just see him having a 330 home run season uh, easily. And let's not forget about Matt Olson. He led the spring uh, with homers. And he's going to probably club at least 30 to 35 out there. So, unfortunately, Mets fans, I think their lineup in the ATL is just way too much to handle. I think they'll overcome this division and actually have the most wins in the NL. Uh, that's my prediction. But I do see the Mets making the playoffs and maybe potentially the Phillies, but we'll get to that shortly. There are two other teams in the NL East, but we're just going to move on. I think everybody knows the fate of those two teams. National League Central. I got to go with the Birds. I got to go with the Redbirds, St. Louis Cardinals. I think they have separated themselves even further from the rest of the division, which isn't a very good division anyway. The addition of Wilson Contreras, you know, replacing Yadier Molina, the offense he brings along with the offense you get at your corners from Arenado, Goldschmidt, Newt Barr, Tommy Edmond. They play great defense all around the diamond. 
their pitching is their weakness, but it's still a solid rotation. You got Flaherty, Miles Mikolas, who just signed a two-year, $40 million extension. Jordan Montgomery. Love Jordan Hicks out of the bullpen, throwing nothing but gas. It's the Cardinals. You want to talk model of consistency? These guys invented consistency when it comes to baseball. You can never count out the St. Louis Cardinals organization. Every five years, you're like, who was in the World Series? Oh, the Cardinals again? Yeah, the Cardinals again. Yeah, I actually foresee big things coming from this ball club. Uh, Paul Goldschmidt won MVP last year. Looks like this will be Adam Wainwright's final season, so he's looking to have his swan song. And uh, again, I'm predicting big things from this club. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the next segment. But uh, I just want to say, Jordan Walker, big things coming from the big fella. We got him coming up. He's making opening day roster. And hey, listen, I kind of made a bold prediction in our first show that he was going to crack camp, and it happened. Uh, So I I want to take that, put that out there, and just say, uh, I told you so. Because I think that was a hell of a prediction at the time. Um, he may not start every single day. Look out for this guy, though. He's going to be super exciting to watch. And, of course, I have him on my fantasy team. So that's why I'm really pumping him up. But I'm all in on him. All in on Jordan Walker. Nah, I mean, the Cardinals, they're the class of the NL Central. The Brewers... Their contention relies solely on the resurgence of Christian Yelich and Christian Yelich only. They're a good offense, but without him, they they they're not a great offense. They they used to be a great offense, and they have a great pitching staff. And yet, it's not going to do anything for them. They're going to miss the playoffs. I believe that. You're right. I think their team has a little bit of an identity crisis, and I think that kind of started. Once they traded Hater, because I think the team itself, when that trade happened, even though he was on the training block for a bit, they were still a little surprised that he left. And I felt like that team kind of just lost their touch and kind of just lost a lot of their fire to, you know, really go for that division and just ultimately lost and didn't even make the wild card. So it was tough for me to kind of flip flop between them. And the Philadelphia Phillies for this wild card. But uh, as I'll touch up on next segment here, uh, I don't foresee the Brewers making it to the playoffs, unfortunately. And for the rest of the division, if I may say real quick with the Cubs, Pirates, I just don't see a whole lot going on. That's exactly how I feel about the NL Central. Whatever. Except for the Cardinals. Here we are. National League West. Two titans at the top of this division. Dodgers. Padres. People were wondering, do the Padres have enough to dethrone the Dodgers? The LA Dodgers last year might have been the least historically significant 111-win baseball team I have ever seen. The Padres beat them in the first round of the playoffs. That should be enough confidence alone for the Padres to feel good about this season, which is why I, no, not I, we are picking them to win the National League Western Division. It'll be the first time since 2006 since the San Diego Padres took this division. And uh, I agree with you with the Dodgers. I mean, they just seem to have a mile of consistency in the regular season. They seem to figure out how to beat these teams in the regular season, how to get to at least 110 wins in the regular season. But when it comes to the playoffs, it seems like they forget that they only need three games for them to lose in the series. Um, And then they just falter. I mean, even going back to the 2020 season when they won the World Series, because it was such a short, stricken season, to me it felt like that was just like a continuation of the regular season for them. And that's why they won that World Series. It hasn't been back since that time. I don't think Dodgers fans really feel too proud of that World Series. I know like they pretend, but deep down inside it eats at them. It really does. They're a bit banged up now uh, going into this season. They lost Gavin Lux, who you know wasn't maybe an everyday player, but he was a big part of that team. And Walker Bueller not being back until maybe early June, that's being optimistic. Justin Turner is now no longer with the club. He's with the Red Sox, so... 
this team, it just seems like they're not getting any better. They didn't really make a ton of moves in the offseason to improve their ball club. And to me, with the Padres, they're going to have now a full season with Juan Soto. They're going to have a full season, hopefully, with Fernando Tatis Jr. They now have a full season to prove that these guys are the best in the division. They proved it in the playoffs last year, and I think they can build that momentum to actually pull out a division win. And I believe that this team is primed and ready to take over. This is going to be a fun race in the uh, NL West, and we'll see how these two teams go head-to-head in the regular season. It's Dodger fatigue at the end of the day. I'm also just sick of the Dodgers. Like you said, we have them both in the wild cards, even in the first spot. I can see them winning 98 games and still being the first spot. And I got the Mets right behind them. And then it really, for me, the third spot, I was really going back and forth a lot, even during this broadcast, really, this this taping of our podcast. Uh, but I'm going with the Phillies, and that's just based off of the signing of Trey Turner. Uh, I think he's a difference maker. And I did have the Brewers at third, but I changed my mind. Uh, Just looking at the lineup for the Phillies, I think they're a little more deeper in terms of their offense. And the pitching is solid as well. I'm going to take the Phillies as my third. There you have it, our 2023 division winners. Let's head over to third base where we'll give you our award winners and our World Series predictions. First up, we got the American League Cy Young Award winner. Who do you got, Foz? Well, Mets fans, I'm sorry to say I'm doing this for the memes. I'm taking Jacob deGrom as my AL Cy Young Award winner. Now look, I'm sorry to say this, but it seems to me that when a Mets player leaves, he flourishes. Justin Turner, for example, flourished with the Dodgers. deGrom, he'll have a healthy season. He'll get 22 wins, and he'll be the AL Cy Young Award winner. Uh, Now look, will this actually happen? Who knows? Who's to say? But I'm in it for the memes, baby. I want to do it for the memes. And I'm saying Jacob deGrom is my Cy Young Award winner. What do you say, Mike? I like Jacob deGrom. I have him winning an award too, just not that one. My Cy Young Award winner this year is the reason why I thought the Toronto Blue Jays were going to win the NL East, AL East this year, excuse me. Alec Manoa. This guy, he is going to turn into a stud. He already was a... AL Cy Young Award candidate last year. Uh, He didn't hit the 200 innings mark yet in his career. I think he's going to surpass that completely. I think he has that innings eater kind of build to him. The bigger, bulkier guy throws hard. He's nasty on the mound. He's an ace in every way, shape, and form. He's going to take another step. Watch out, American League hitters. Alec Manoa, 2023 Cy Young Award winner. Now to the National League. Julio Urias is my guy to win the National League Cy Young this year. He slowly, slowly built his way up to this. The Dodgers in the beginning used him as a reliever, actually got the clinching out of that 2020 World Series. Yeah, I know, very forgettable. <laughs> but no, this this guy is going to have a lights out season. Um, he's electric. I actually used to call him the young Sandy Koufax, and I got laughed at by a lot of people for saying that. And uh, it seems like year after year, the last couple of years, I'm like, well, I don't know. That was such a crazy take. My pick, however, is kind of a shocker. It's not even the ace of a team. I'm going out on a limb on this one. I'm going to say Spencer Strider of the Atlanta Braves is going to win the Cy Young Award winning. Yeah, I know. Shocking. Not even Max Fried. I just want to take a deeper look into Spencer Strider's starts last year and just kind of give you a picture of what he did. So he was only 11 and 5, but he did have a 2.67 ERA. He started 20 games, right? Only threw 131 innings. This is going to be his third, technically his second year. He only he only threw two innings in 2021. So let's just say this is his second year. The Atlanta Braves, to me, they always just bloom these great starting pitchers from their uh, their minor league camps and their minor league teams. We saw it with Max Fried. Max Fried's first year, he did decent, and then he took a huge step up. I'm just basing this off of history. I think Spencer Strider goes above and beyond his performance this year, and he winds up winning the NL Cy Young. It's a crazy take. I think it's it's probably one of the craziest ones that I have, but I want to get a little bold in some of them, and this one I felt 
like I could go out on a limb on. And that's kind of why I'm taking him. I- I'm curious to hear what you think about that. Well, personally, I think you got lost in the mustache. <laughs> <laughs> no. In all honesty, no, I don't think that's a crazy pick at all. I think you could flip-flop a Max Fried or Spencer Strider. Those guys, they both have, a, they both can be in the running for the National League Cy Young Award. I think Spencer Strider might be even slightly more electric than Max Fried. He's probably going to be another one of those players that the Braves are going to look to lock up as soon as they can if they haven't done it already. Turning our attention to the 2023 American League MVP. This is a no-brainer, guys. It's going to be Shohei Otani. He won it in 2021, and he's going to win it again in 2023. He's the greatest player in the universe, and he should have no problem being the greatest player in the American League this season. Fazio, how do you feel? Yeah, I feel the same exact way. Uh, Barring a crazy run uh, from somebody either chasing a triple crown or even the home run record, I just see him being his usual dominant self, being the MVP. Unfortunately, he's not going to make the playoffs yet again, but maybe, as you said, a certain New York team could sign him later and get him to the playoffs because this dude needs to be in the playoffs. We saw in the WBC how exciting he is to watch. It would just be that much more exciting if he's in the playoffs, but he won't be with the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Unfortunately, it will be with a different team. However, they still will have an MVP season from Shohei Otani. There's no doubt in my mind, he is the best player in the world. And uh, some of you pitchers out there, you better be careful he doesn't steal a Cy Young from you either. Now we turn our attention to the National League Most Valuable Player. We were talking about the Padres, how they were going to overtake the National League West, and a big reason why that is is Mr. Consistent. Yup, Manny Machado. He's going to take the National League MVP this year. I believe it. Ever since he's went to the Padres, he's been a model of consistency. I feel like his attitude has changed a little bit. He's become more of a team leader, which I think will help him get some more votes because at the end of the day, it is the media who does vote for this, and he's had a much better relationship with them since. He's grown as a player, grown as a leader. This is Manny's year, I think. It's a good prediction. He was runner-up last year, and of course, Paul Goldschmidt won the uh, the MVP last year for the Cardinals in the NL. Um, so I think that is a great prediction. I mean, the Padres, like we said, are probably going to be one of the best teams in the league, and he's probably going to be one of the main reasons why they're going to be there. However, I'm going to go with Nolan Arenado of the Cardinals. Yes, Cardinals Nation, back-to-back MVPs in St. Louis is my prediction. Nolan Arenado is a special player. Uh, He's one of the best defenders I've ever seen on a baseball field and offensively can rake. So I'm really going out on a limb with the Cardinals here, but I just, I believe in the team and I believe in their whole like ecosystem of players. And I think he will be the one to hoist that trophy at the end of the year. Who knows? Maybe we might be going to a St. Louis Cardinals World Series parade. (laughs) I mean, it would be kind of it would be kind of awkward a Meth fan of the Yankee fan there, but hey, hey, look, you can get Jordan Walker's autograph or something too, and maybe he'll even let you borrow his underwear or something (laughs) since you love him so much. Hey, I'll take it all. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for all possibilities. Speaking of Rookie of the Year, let's let's go to the American League. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna say this straight up, and I think a lot of people feel this way. I'm going Gunnar Henderson. That that kid could swing the damn bat. He is part of this Orioles rebuild. He's gonna be part of their next generation's winning team. He wins this by a landslide this year. I wanted to wait until the very last second to reveal who my AL Rookie of the Year would be. Unfortunately, I don't think we have news as of this recording as of right now if he's even going to make the opening day roster. But I'll just say I'm going to go with Anthony Volpe. This is a straight up homer pick. I needed a Yankee to represent my homerness in this prediction. And I felt like this was like a perfect opportunity for that. Uh, We haven't really talked about Volpe on the show just yet. But believe me, we're probably going to talk a lot about him throughout the season. And uh, I'm hoping he breaks camp as the starting shortstop. He'll be the youngest to ever start for the Yankees since DJ El Capitan did it in 1996. So he's got the potential to be the next great shortstop in Yankee allure. Let's shift over to the National League Rookie of the Year. Fazio, take this. We all know who you're going to love. 
Jordan Walker, baby. Going all in. Walker St. Louis Cardinal. That's going to be my nickname for him. The only thing that kind of scares me about this pick is that he's never seen triple A before. He's only been as far as double A, but because he's just been so powerful at the plate and just such a huge presence in the clubhouse. I mean, they were kind of forced to their hand. They're like, Oh, we got to bring them up. I mean, I, I do appreciate that about the Cardinals though. I will say that, that when they do have a stud prospect, they're going to, they're not shy to, you know, leave him in the minors for a month or so. And then making sure like his service is ready to go by the end of the month. They just want to get those guys up as soon as possible. They see the potential and they want them to succeed. So shout out to the organization for doing that. And, uh, Jordan Walker all the way, baby. Let's go. I touched on uh, a rookie that I liked previously on an episode. My guy, Corbin Carroll of the Arizona Diamondbacks, recently signed a contract extension for eight years. Yeah, if he could just get over his you know, inability to hit lefties, albeit a small sample size from last year, he should, this kid should be a, one of the game's top, top outfielders for sure. Power bat. Great discipline at the plate. I was looking at his numbers in the minors, over a 400 on base percentage. Uh, doesn't strike out too, too much. Corbin Carroll is the reason why that future looks so bright in Arizona. We love a nice redemption story here on the Baseball 360 podcast, which is why we want to choose our comeback players of the year for the year 2023. And let me start. Fazio, you and I are sharing a brain a little bit. I thought somebody different was going to win the AL Cy Young Award. You think Mr. DeGrom is going to win 22 games and win the AL Cy Young? I'm not going to go that far. However, he will be my comeback player of the year for the American League. He started 11 games last season. In those 11 games, you know the whole bit, you know, struck out over 100 guys in 60-something innings. If he makes... 25 starts this year for the Rangers, he'll light it up. I, I think he'll be a shoe in for the comeback player of the year. Now, when it comes to who they pick, that kind of is out of the hands of the player sometimes. It just depends on how they feel about a certain player. But Jacob DeGrom, no reason why he can't win comeback player of the year. Yeah, I mean, if I took it for Cy Young, theoretically, he would be the comeback player of the year. I didn't do that. Uh, but now that I'm hearing you talk about it, maybe I should have. But I'm not going to back down. I'm going to say who mine was. Uh, I'm actually going to go with Brandon Lowe of the Tampa Bay Rays. Now, he was shut down last season with a lower back stress uh, injury. I think he only played like 65 games last year. And going back to 2020 and 2021, obviously 2020 being a short season, he still had like MVP type seasons. And now, you know, with this injury behind him, he's looking pretty good in the spring. I anticipate that, you know, he hits around 290 uh, and gets this offense going for the Rays again. And, you know, like with you predicting them getting back into the playoff or getting into the playoffs in the wild card, I think he'll be one of the bigger contributing factors on offense because of that. And for that reason, that's why I'm going to take him as the comeback player. We love those comeback stories. Let's head over to the National League. We got some names for this category. That's that's all I'm going to say. Do you want to go first or do I want to go first? Who, who, I, let me say it. Go Can for I go? it. Can go I for go? it. All right. My 2023 National League Comeback Player of the Year will miss the first 20 games of the Major League Baseball season due to a suspension. He was a bad boy. Hello? Fernando Tatis Jr. of that loaded San Diego Padres roster who will win the National League West alongside the MVP Manny Machado? This is a no-brainer. Put that guy on the field. Fast forward to the end of the season. Look at the back of that baseball card. You're going to be impressed. Fernando Tatis Jr. all the way. Health is the biggest concern for him in my opinion, but you would think with the suspension coming up, for 20 games, he served 60 last season. You know, he should be ready to go. He should have been, you know, he's in spring training practicing. I think I saw a stat where, like, he had a really, really tough go in the beginning of spring training, but then he really just got on fire. I think he hit, like, over 450 in the last, like, week or so. So it wouldn't surprise me if he's up there. I'm going to actually go with a player that 
is on a team that is probably going to be one of the worst teams in the league. However, I think he will be a big bright spot on the offense there in Colorado. And I'm going to take Chris Bryant. Now, Chris Bryant, he signed that contract last year with the Rockies. Didn't really perform that well. Actually had probably one of his worst years as a professional. Um, and you know how great he was with the Cubs. He certainly has the air. He has the location to do it. And I think he, he can. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take him as my NL comeback player. Last but not least, our final prediction. It's not an award they give out. Nobody's going to receive a plaque for this. But this is just something we, we want to do. We're going to predict who will hit the most home runs in all of baseball this year. Last year it was Aaron Judge, obviously, with his 62 homers. But this year, who is going to be the game's biggest masher? I'm going to take our guy in Toronto, Vlad Guerrero Jr. I think he's ready to, like we said before, really step up, show that offensive power. I think he's going to hit 53 bombs this year and lead the league. Uh, He's got the talent to do it. He's, what, 26 now, 27 years old. His his dad, I don't think, ever led the league in most home runs. But when Vlad Guerrero Jr. was coming up, they were kind of predicting him to kind of take over as, like, the home run king. And because of his size and his power, obviously. And I think this year he's finally going to showcase that and get to 53 home runs. I'm curious, though, did you pick someone of the same squad or are you going somewhere else? I'm going home for this one, my friend. Can you see that? Can you see that? It's blurry. (laughs) I'm going with the polar bear, Pete Alonzo of the New York Mets. He led the majors in his rookie season with 52 homers back in 2019. How many is he going to hit this year? Let's just go with over 50. That's a lot of homers. Will that lead the league? You better believe it. Vladdy Jr. is great. He's going to hit a bunch of home runs too. So, But I think I think Pete Alonso is going to crack the 50 mark again. I really feel it. And look, that doesn't mean Vladdy can't hit 49 homers either. Well, I think this is a bit of a homer pick. Uh, I think Pete Alonso, even though he had a great 2019 home run showing, not exactly sure if he can fulfill that again, in my opinion. But... Hey, look, we all have a homer pick in one of our categories, so I'll give you this one for sure. Let's get down to business. Who's going to win the World Series this year? The Fall Classic. Who's going to be hoisting that piece of metal, according to Rob Madford, above their head? It's a lot more than that, Commissioner Rob. Are we going to see the first back-to-back champion in over 20 years this year? Well, I think the Astros will make it to the World Series again this year. However, I do not see them winning it. I'm going with the St. Louis Cardinals. Again, pushing all my red chips in, banking on this team to win the World Series. And my prediction for them mainly being because, again, we got Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt, two MVPs, predicting Arenado to win the MVP. Jordan Walker... Hopefully he has a rookie of the year award. I don't think he will, you know, deep down in my gut, but I'm going with it anyway. I want to see this team make it so far as the World Series only because Wainwright's last year, they have the talent to do it. Their offense is insane. Their defense, like you said, is one of the best in the league. And honestly, when it comes down to a team making it to the World Series, it comes down to to plays where you make it in the outfield. You're making plays in the infield. You're getting those clutch hits, clutch homers. Every You look at the roster top to bottom, every one of those guys can contribute in some way, shape, or form to those clutch performances. So I'm going to take the Cardinals in six games against the Astros, 4-2. I think you see it a little bit differently, though. I do. I think baseball is going to see a repeat champion. Finally, that's right. I'm going to take the Houston Astros in a 2021 World Series rematch. They're going to defeat the Braves of Atlanta. I think these two teams are the best in their leagues. Uh, I think their rosters are very deep. 
There's also some World Series pedigree on both these rosters, too. Not just rosters filled with talented players, but players who've played in these games before already. And, you know, I think it's just a crapshoot. Can the Braves beat the Astros again? Absolutely. That Astros roster is just so complete. Could be a seven-game World Series for all I know, but I'm going to go with the Houston Astros. I respect that call. We'll have to check in month after month to see how these predictions hold up. I'm sure we'll be laughing at a lot of them, <laughs> to be honest with you. But, you know, we're just doing this for fun, and we're seeing if we can get you know, a Nostradamus-like prediction out there. So uh, You're absolutely right. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this season starting, and uh, I think at the, about this time we got through all of our predictions. I think we're finally ready to round third and head for home as we wrap up this regular season podcast prediction show. Now that we're heading home, opening day, just a couple of days away, I couldn't be more excited now that we have our predictions in and the season is, is almost here. Opening day is the best day of the year. It's it's a holiday in and of itself for baseball fans. I plan on watching baseball all day long. Um, if uh, you're watching at home, we're going to be posting a lot of content, um, short form content, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, some YouTube shorts. Uh, it's going to be fun. So look out for that. However you like to spend your opening day, you know, feel free watching it. Call out of work, watch all the baseball you want, go grab some beers. Just relax, baby. It's baseball season. Live a little. Yeah, definitely. I'll definitely be, you know, tuning into all the games that day as well. Whatever is, you know, on my local market, of course. I do have the MLB network, so I'll definitely be tuned in there. I'll be watching the Yankees play the Giants 105 to start the season for sure. Go Yanks, of course. And for you fans out there that are watching or listening, Throw your predictions down in the comments. I'd love to see some more predictions down, even all across our social media, either on Twitter or Facebook, Reddit, wherever we are. We're going to put ourselves more out there as the weeks roll along. But as for our predictions and your predictions, feel free to look, put those down in the comments below on YouTube. Thanks for watching us and thanks for tuning into us and subscribing. Hopefully we get you know a little bit more of an audience as the season rolls along. And I'm sure with our special guests coming up, We'll be able to get a little more juice uh, to our channel. But, you know, for the day ones out there, thank you again for supporting us and watching us. And we hope you enjoy as we roll along. Couldn't have said it better myself, Fazio. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week.